Well, thank you so much, Tamu Fasher, and all of the um, all of the volunteers who have put this together. It's so everything is so beautiful. I I just love being in this space in this home. So thank you. Uh, today, I'm uh, sharing some new areas in research. I've been in the Tang Dynasty for my oh for 40 years. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is getting into uh, uncharted territory for me, so I welcome feedback and suggestions. So I'm still getting used to my relationship with the microphone here. So the, as I said, the title has changed to Ways to Practice Like This Is Our Home. Uh, for some time, so I'm talking in the first part about what I mean by our home or our household. For some time, I have been interested in the role of religious or sacred elements in dynamics of economic exchange. A classic starting point is Marcel Mauss's theory that early human cultural experience involved relatively small groups of individuals embedded in systems that he called total social phenomena. For him, this meant lived worlds where economic, social, and sacred ties were not separated. In a similar spirit of recognizing entanglement in complex systems, in Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, uh, the economist Kate Raworth calls for the need to regenerate or re-recognize ties between economic activities, social values, and the complex systems in which they are embedded. As we will explore today, this would entail a shift from growth and extraction-based systems to regenerative and resilient systems. She writes, when political economy was split up into political philosophy versus economic science in the late 19th century, it opened up what the philosopher Michael Sandel has called, oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, good. Um, uh, Sandel has called a moral vacancy at the heart of public policy making. Today, economists and politicians debate with confident ease in the name of economic efficiency, productivity, and growth, as if those values were self-explanatory, while hesitating to speak of justice, fairness, and rights. Talking about values and long-term goals is a lost art waiting to be revived." End quote. In this paper, I discuss some of the critical challenges and moral issues that arise when we try to imagine how values could be reintegrated into the art of economics. As both Mose and Raworth point out, the art of economics has roots in human organization around hearth and households. Uh, Raworth says, the word economics was coined by the philosopher Xenophon in ancient Greece, combining oikos, meaning household, with nomos, meaning rules or norms, he invented the art of household management, and it could not be more relevant today." End quote. Today, whether we recognize it... Sorry, because we need, need to open the page. Oh, OK. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm not there yet. So... Yeah, the, the slides are sort of for the middle when I do a very quick overview of Kate Raworth. Um, so, thanks, because I wouldn't have known where the slides are on this system. Mm -hmm. That's fine, we can all Take a breath. Is that, is that up there? Is that up there? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then I, and then it goes with the. Um, how does it? Oh, yep. It moves. Okay. Yay. Technology. <laughs> um, today, whether we recognize it or not, the multicultural global economy and technology. <laughs> is the hearth around which most households are organized. 
At the same time, we are becoming ever more aware that we are in a burning household. Many have used that metaphor from the Lotus Sutra lately. Um, though humans have not yet been able to institute a global regulatory system, a global sense of household uh, where there are increasingly viable experiments in small scale networks of households organized around regenerative systems may be emerging. Complementing these on the ground ad hoc experiments, theorists in a number of disciplines are converging in the call to discard mechanical models and adopt complex system models. And this is what Raworth is doing. In economic terms, this would entail shifting away from linear, non-renewable extractive practices and moving towards participation in regenerative systems. Today I would like to outline two different kinds of models of regenerative systems, Raworth's donut economics and permaculture principles as inspired by Jeff Lawton and my own on-the-ground exper experiments in gardening. Um, neither model is Buddhist, but both are permeable to Buddhist practices. Part playfully and part mournfully, I offer these models as contributions to a new bodhisattva ground, which I'm calling uh, ways to practice like a 21st century earth store householder bodhisattva. Earth store meaning deedzang. So, deedzang zaijia pusa. Um, in thinking about a, how a Dizang Zaijia pusa, pusa might practice, I have been influenced by the work of my fellow speakers here, <laughs> and many of you in the audience. Um, I'm calling this new ground because, as Raworth argues, we humans have never before been forced to try to override our cumulative history of survival skills in order to survive. So the first part, uh, Kate Raworth's Donut Economics. Um, I can't really do justice to this book. I highly recommend reading it because she uses a lot of concrete examples and I can't set all those up. I don't have time. Um, but she's, she's really good about, she has on the ground experience as you will see. So she's really good about backing up what she says with examples. Um, so she uh, was educated at Oxford University with you know, high level degrees in economics, but she also worked with micro entrepreneurs in the villages of Zanzibar. She co-authored the Human Development Report for the United Nations Development Program. She's a senior researcher at Oxfam with on the ground experience with Oxfam. And she's now um, basically running uh, workshops and, and MA programs uh, in sustainability leadership. So her argument the, in the first part of the book is, is based on analyzing why the way economics taught is taught is wrong. Well, okay. Um, she, she goes through how we got to this point, and we shall quickly run through, um, and then makes arguments for how we can get back out. So what she's calling homo uh, economicus is uh, basically rational economic man, self-interested individuals competing in the marketplace. Um, so these are all quotes from her. This may be the smallest unit of analysis in economic theory, but his composition has profound consequences. Adam Smith's first portrait of rational economic man may have included self-interest but that self-interest was tempered by humanity, justice, generosity, and public spirit. And Adam Smith also believed in regulating corporations. Um, John Stuart Mill simplified rational economic man to, quote, solely a being who desires to possess wealth in order to simplify economic analysis and transform it from an art into a science. As in many fields, this desire to bring things into alignment with science sometimes with very good intentions, has created problems, however. As the portrait of homo economics, economicus developed, it became more stylized and more divorced from reality. He is solitary, has an all-consuming fixation on utility, insatiable desires, and perfect knowledge and foresight. But this last point is the kicker for her. What had started as a model of man had turned into a model for man. 
The self-interest model actually degrades empathy, compassion, and altruism in those who study and subscribe to it. It also transforms the multi-voiced citizen into the mono-voiced consumer. So there, she cites te, you know, studies that are done where people read um, something supporting this model and then they behave less generously immediately afterwards. So she uh, draws, one of her critiques is of a very influential economist at MIT, Paul Samuelson, the man who drew economics. So this, his diagrams, um, you know, what she's focusing on here is that this circle that can be analyzed and, and tweaked, um, if you'll notice the I don't know if I have any arrows here, but the tech change, et cetera, is, you know, is all the stuff that's going in, um, and then there's no um, accounting for what happens to what goes in and what, where the waste is going. So as she says, the circular flow diagram makes no mention of the energy and materials on which economic activity depends, nor of the society within, within which those activities take place. They are simply missing from its cast of characters. Did Samuelson omit them on purpose? Unlikely. He was, after all, merely intent on illustrating the flow of income. And so they literally didn't come into the picture. With, but with that, the stage was set for mainstream GDP growth-driven economics. And as she's arguing, this is still the way economics is taught, basically. So she proposes instead the donut with the recognition of this conundrum. Here's the conundrum. No country has ever ended human deprivation without a growing economy. And no country has ever ended ecological degradation with one. So we're in new ground, as Tom Fasher pointed out. Um, and Kate Raworth is proposing that we can aim for a kind of middle ground in between uh, deprivation and planetary degradation. So that's the donut in between those, the sort of sweet spot or sweet circle. So for the rest of the, my um, in, introduction of her work, we'll be focusing on some details of that model. So she puts, um, she's trying to um, put all of the things that were left out in Samuelson's model back into the circle. So things like housing, gender equality, social equity, political voice, networks, education, water, food, health, all of those things are the social foundation and matrix for this safe and just space. I mean, she says humanity and of course I know she would be happy to include all beings, as, as we, we Buddhists would like to add to that picture. Um, and without recognizing the, the use, how all of those networks inside the donut are being used, um, there's no way to recognize how much uh, the, the outer circle is, it, we're, we're heading into the outer layer, the nose no life zone, the outer circle. So all of her um, models then are aimed towards showing how these, the, the things that we're drawing from, our matrix, our ground, um, can be integrated into our ideas about exchange and relationship. So um, briefly, she makes proposals, seven ways to think like a 21st century ec economist change the goal from expanding GDP to meeting the human rights of every person within the means of our life-giving planet. And she also makes arguments about why this, this makes sense um, to draw, uh, to support all of the resiliency and regeneracy potential um, in people's relationships with their own local systems. See the big picture by embedding econo uh, economics within society and nature. Nurture human nature by moving past the concept of rational economic man to humans as social, interdependent, approximating, fluent in values, and dependent on li the living world. So that's, um, she explains all of those and 
Um, there's, especially with the interdependent part, there's a lot of overlap with Buddhist uh, perspectives. Get savvy with systems by integrating an understanding of systems thinking, and we'll go into that shortly. Summed up by a pair of feedback loops, which we'll look at. Design to distribute by recognizing that economic inequality is a design failure, not an economic necessity. And there are ways to design, design economies that are far more distributive of the value that they generate, generate. Create to regenerate by recognizing that ecological degradation is the result of degenerative industrial design. Economic systems can be designed to be regenerative and circular rather than linear. Be agnostic about growth because unlimited growth is impossible. What we need are economies that make us thrive whether or not they grow. So those are the headings under which she provides uh, much more analysis and examples. Ooh, this is a bit faded. Um, so these are her uh, sort of charts. She's also drawing economics here. So she draws out a number of charts um, about ways to switch from the old style to a 21st century goal. Um, I'm not going to try to go through those. They're a bit fuzzy on this slide. Um, but two, I want to point out, there, there are two kinds of myths that she singles out. The idea that growth will even things up again, in other words, trickle-down economics, and growth will clean it up again, like, you know, we'll generate all this technology that will somehow magically wipe our carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so those are myths that she addresses at length. So rather than, so these loops, she's, she's saying a critical point, rather than take, make, consume, use, and waste, um, she's saying you, you, what you want to do is build loops in, take, make, um, and then regenerate and capture value at each stage of decomposition of whatever you make and make it so that can be done. Um, and restore, repair, reuse, refurbish, recycle. So don't waste things. And um, I would also like to quote one of my favorite economists, Prabhat uh, Patnayak from, from um, Kerala. He said, the problem is not that we are such good consumers. The problem is we are such good producers. We love to make things. So we can make things better. We have that I think we have that interest and even that passion, but we just need um, the system to, to better support that urge that we have to make things. Um, so this is another somewhat fuzzy thing, but um, basically she is talking about the matrix of the economy in terms of household, market, state, and commons. And she analyzes um, each of those, how um, energy and materials going into that uh, matrix can, that matrix can reduce the waste that uh, is then produced from human use. So, um, she talks about an embedded economy, so what kinds of resources that are now just being extracted um, that we are, they were taking out, and how we can put back into those systems. So right now, uh, we depend on extracting finite resources, and the economy likewise depends on Earth as the sink for its waste. The economy, as treated in this current theory, is an open system, but the Earth itself is a closed system. So recognizing that it's a closed system is important. Limits. Redefining the economy is made up of four realms of provisioning, not just the market. Households produce core goods for their own members. The market produces private goods for those willing and able to pay. The commons produce co-created goods for the communities involved, including education and healthcare and so on. And the state produces public goods, including education and healthcare and so, healthcare and so on, for all the populace. So she goes into how that models for how that might work. So one example in the household, recognizing that home caregivers are supporting the economy and find ways to make that, to make that uh, not economically detrimental 
for women, particularly. So um, let's see how we're doing for time. So I'm going until 10, right? Until 10, yeah. I think I'm just trying to decide if I have time to go through this. Um, so briefly speaking, she, uh, she goes into five shifts. So from self-interested reciprocity to social reciprocity. Uh, so this um, is basically a form of prisoner's dilemma that is used extensively in sort of game theory economics. We are conditionally cooperative as long as others do the same and punish freeloaders even if it costs us personally. So um, it, she brings up examples of smaller societies where sharing is more valuable for survival than calculations of quid pro quo reciprocity. And again, this is based on various studies and tests. From fixed preferences to fluid values, so seeing adults not as sovereign consumers, but influenced by an advertising, more accurately propaganda, that associates project, products with deeply held values. Personal values can be manipulated. And she goes into extensive examples about um, Sigmund Freud's nephew, who sort of created the, the um, system of marketing based on his recognition of psychological uh, weak points. <laughs> Um, and so she proposes alternative uh, models for uh, the ways of communicating about economic activities. So she recognizes that navigating social roles and context is important to us, and we can be particularly min uh, manipulated by, you know, as we see in Facebook, by um, appeals to enhancing our social role. So uh, from isolated to interdependent, uh, we follow social norms and superficial so social influence will grow as our lives become more tightly networked. Conspicuous consumption trends and trickle-down behaviorism, in, our, in other words, rewarding selfish behavior, are particularly troubling in the context of high inequality within and between countries. So this, again, this self-interested man model is influencing behavior, but that's not because it is, in fact, bedrock truth. It is, it is a process of um, what she calls, what she's saying is propaganda. So from calculating to approximating, this is an interesting point that she brings in. Um, she points out that what we think of or what we're told to think of as rational is shot through with cognitive biases. So the idea that newer and more accessible information is better, um, avoiding loss rather than making gains, and she goes into, you know, these are gains that might be gains for everyone, not just for oneself. Uh, selective cognition, preferring information that fits within our existing frames. And there's a lot of reinforcement of that in the, in the internet um, communities. And risk uh, bias, underestimating the likelihood of extreme events and overestimating our ability to deal with them. So these, um, if we recognize that these rational calculations are actually usually biased, this may help to revalidate our approximating capacities, which includes feelings and relationships. So just as she wants to reintegrate society and nature into our economic cycles, our understanding of economic cycles, she would like to reintegrate feelings and relationships into our way of thinking about what we're doing and what we're making. So rather than seeing money as value neutral, uh, we should be aware that what it means in terms of social goods and affected states, we try to, and what we try to buy with it, feelings of security, feelings of being fairly treated, and being in supported rela supportive relationships. So she's arguing that you know, this sort of wealth mania um, is really more about sort of uh, seeking security gone wildly awry, <laughs> as David Lloyd points out in several of his books. Um, so 
I don't have time to go into it here, but I looked up this Maslowian model, and it's being used in business schools. So the feeling that we are safe, that we need to establish a baseline of being safe, having enough, and belonging. There is, I found a page in a, a sort of business school advertisement, advertising journal that was pointing out how you can manipulate each one of those things. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, they were, they, you know, they, um, I, I'm not bashing business schools. They're going to be the matrix from which we can regenerate, really, if, if they can, you know, if shifts can be made. Um, and then finally, from dominant to dependent, we need to understand that our relationship to nature is not one of a pyramid with humans at the top. It is a complex web, and I'm sure all of us are, are um, on board with that. This can be promoted through education in eco-literacy and changing the lexicon we use to describe the natural world, from resources to relatives. So that's um, a very quick overview. I highly recommend the book, um, the examples, the details, the devil's in the details. The details are really compelling. So now I'd like to um, switch to my own on-the-ground experiments uh, with permaculture principles. So I'm trying to work on my own small piece of land using principles that I learned from an online permaculture course uh, for, that went for about two years, um, run by Jeff Lawton in Australia. Um, this experiment has been extremely difficult. I am not yet able to do it, in part because the infrastructure is expensive. It would make sense to share infrastructure costs with the community. However, even if there were such a community in Calgary, Investing the necessary resources of my time into it would probably make it impossible for me to do my university job well. This points to the fact that our current systems are not well integrated. They tend toward compartmentalization and linear flow charts of time and money. So here are some selected permaculture principles that I've been working with, illustrated by simple examples. First, Commit attention to life cycles, and this is what Robert is, is recommending. One must pay sustained daily attention to flows of energy in the system so as to keep everything circulating in such a way as to produce enough food for the community. The community includes the plants and animals that will at some point become food. This takes a lot of time. Learning curves shorten, but things always change. For example, a cow that did not eat fruit tree bark last year might do it this year, and your fruit tree will die. <laughs> you have to keep paying attention. Second, take birth, decay, and death as the basic media of your work and art. Um, and I'm taking work as a form of art, ideally. Um, in this mode, entanglements with and as life are not detached from, they are cultivated. One elementary example is that waste cannot be wasted. It must go back into the cycle. So basic permaculture 101 is you're learning about the safe use of human manure as fertilizer. Um, then be symbiotic, not parasitic. If products are taken as the only measure of value for our work, then the human condition is to be a parasite, a consumer, and thereby the host of parasites parasites, in other words, fodder for the market. However, if one consents to symbiosis, then one pays into the system with the life one receives from it. Complex and aesthetically compelling patterns of entanglement emerge. Um, there is now a lot, I won't go into examples here because there's so much good literature on the theme, you know, people writing about their own experiences with this, um, this, this kind of engagement. And I, I'm happy to make my recommendations. Slow down and let yourself get entangled. Slow processes, processes enable more entanglement, which enable more edges and so-called boundary conditions, which the permaculturist wants to cultivate. These foster diversity of life, which tends to be beautiful and messy. Our urge to destroy life support systems that took many millennia to reach self-sustaining maturity ranges from burning the Amazon rainforest 
to our fondness for smooth lawns and border walls. For example, I have learned to become fond of dandelions. As any gardener knows, they seem to want to take over everything. However, over the past three years, I have observed that their enthusiasm, if left relatively unchecked, naturally gives way to greater diversity, including more nitrogen fixers like clover and wild peas. I surmise that this is because their roots are deacidifying the soil. All of these principles, attention to cycles, extending the pathways of birth and death, allowing oneself to be entangled, and cultivating slowness and messiness, support the proposition that living beings are in some ways exceptions to the law of entropy, laws of entropy. Entropy is the degree of disorder or randomness of interactions in a system. Sorry, I didn't put a slide up for this one. The second law of thermodynamics states that energy exchanges or transformations always involve loss of energy. And thus, energy interactions in a closed system tend towards entropy, just lack of motion, lack of, lack of interaction, what's any whatsoever. Patterned energy dynamics are integral to life, but living beings appear to be unique in their lack of conformity to the second law. Uh, a sort of anthropologist, uh, interesting writer named uh, Jimena Canales said in her article, Dead and Alive, um, micro cinematography between physics and biology says, only living beings seem to have the potential to go on and on against the second law of thermodynamics that accounted um, for entropy, energy loss, and friction. William Thompson, known as Lord Kelvin, at first excluded vegetative action and chemical action from the laws of thermodynamics, but he eventually agreed that these could be explained in solely physical terms. The only thing he continued to exclude from those laws are living beings. And we could argue to include plants back in that. So, in quote, um, the, so the permaculture perspective is that self-regenerating food-producing systems act more like a living being than a closed system. Such systems also defy the laws of entropy. They recycle patterns of energy rather than running down towards random interaction or needing non-renewable inputs. Ordering principles, as modern humans have tended to conceive them, things like grids, bullet points, clear boundaries and blank spaces, are actually entropic because they separate things rather than cultivating circulation, entanglement, and slow process. So I began to think in terms of these anti-entropic dynamics when I was taking the online permaculture course by Jeff Lawton. Um, and a key permaculture design feature is the need to slow the energy that flows through the system. Lawton illustrates this by the flow of water, which manifests low life form diversity and high energy at its alpine, alpine source. Water is high energy as it moves quickly through many small channels. Oh, that's that one, sorry. Um, but there is little life because this energy is not easily captured by life forms. So top of a mountain, mountain rushing streams, but you can have bare rock. Um, flow speed decreases as water consolidates and develops the winding patterns of rivers and the collection points of pools and lakes. A low energy pattern corresponds with increases in organic life and decay inputs as flows converge and slow into deltas, wetlands, and reefs of immense life diversity. Energy leaves the relevant system by merging with the open ocean. This is entropy from the perspective of the permaculturists who can no longer capture its flow or cultivate the life forms that flourish along the edges of its pathways. However, this water example can be a metaphor for ways that um, our entire Earth is included in this, in this anti-entropic system. In the book I'm currently working on, I track this principle that the dynamics of relationality slow energy through systems and create conditions that support more complex patterns of circulation. Part of this work in process will involve drawing detailed analogies between permaculture principles and Raworth's donut economics. 
From the foregoing, I hope it is apparent that they share enthusiasm for cycles, cultivation of complexity, and the embeddedness of human transactions in natural systems. I also probe and critique the human tendency, whether in economics or religions, to yearn toward transcendence of these complexities and entanglements. I argue that our drive toward imaginary transhumanity is linked with our existential ambivalence, expressed in our tendency to try to reduce complexity in organic life. Pursuit of reductionist, sanitized transcendence is a recurring theme in many religious movements. From the Taoist celestial masters to Buddhist versions, some Buddhist versions of the Pure Land, and to rapture eschatologists in Christianity. In writings on the spiritual life, humans have repeatedly expressed uh, aesthetic preferences for high energy, low organic life conditions, associating escape from physical limitations with mountain peaks, deserts, oceans, and adamantine cities, or now virtual cities. Anti-entropic living beings and systems indisputably involve the suffering of birth, decay, and death, not getting what we think we want when we want it, and learning that things are not as we think. There is no question, if the universe had gone from the Big Bang to entropy in a nanosecond, there would be no suffering and no need for Buddhism. But would we really prefer that? So provisional conclusions. However we got here, here we are. And since here involves incredible diversity of mysterious forms and forces, background microwave radiation, gravitational waves, photosynthesis, microbes, black holes, giraffes, humans, and so on, I personally think it behooves us to be involved in cultivating diversity. Not just as a matter of survival, but as practitioners of skillful arts that imitate the way the universe appears to be working. Yes, the ways of the world are painful. Yes, it produced us, so it's not perfect by any measure. But who is measuring? To practice skillful arts as Dizang Zaijia Pusa, we would need to pay careful, close attention to the world that captivates us and work with the media at hand. And in order to work together, we would have to agree to shelve the idea of an escape route, either to Sukhavati or Nirvana or Mars. The ox cart of the Buddha vehicle may indeed be available to remove us from the confines of our vain desires, as the Lotus Sutra claims. Yet Chan Buddhists have often reminded us that this should not mean that our immediate home is left behind. And as many have pointed out, realizing the truth of the lack of an independent agent does not mean evading responsibility for individual action. Skillful individual action here and now would mean acting collectively. Our human ingenuity has created the burning house that we now occupy along with the many beings of the planet. And our sciences have shown us more and more clearly that all beings are works of art beyond our skills to reproduce. Even the scorpions and serpents so vividly described in the burning house parable in the Lotus Sutra. Rather than escape artists, I would wish us to be regenerative systems artists and caretakers of the arts of others. And that, as Zhuangzi said, includes the shit and the ants. As our house, whose worth is calculated in terms of GDP growth, product flows, and deliverables goes up in smoke, my hope is that we will have the chance to regroup and become what we are capable of being. For me, the take-home message from our difficult human road to this turning point is that we will never be masters of the universe, the planet, or even our own bodies. But we are able to master the skillful means at play all around us and within us all the time, if we would try. I would like to end on this note. We are trying. Yesterday was one of the largest in a series of massive Friday rallies by teens, initially mobilized by the young Swede. Greta Thun Thunberg. Their global climate strike movement is calling for collective recognition of a state of climate emergency. They are demanding coordinated governmental and grassroots action to end fossil fuel dependency. This is a heartening, potentially game-changing development. Thank you.
Great. Thank you, Dr. Adam. Yeah, you really give us a lot of things about it. Which one is doing that? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Okay. Feedback loops. <laughs> Another important pr permaculture principle. Is, is this one more? Okay. Yes. Give us a lot to think about us as messy human beings, what we can do in our relationship to the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Oh, we could just meditate for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. period and our theme is going to be uh, Zen or Chan's Chinese ancestors. Um, mm. We uh, don't want that to be uh, an academic exercise. We want to look at their lives and teachings and mm. what we find mm. uh, to support mm -hmm. the yeah. crisis uh, of our every, uh, that we face in our everyday lives. Uh, do you have any um, Suggestions for us. No, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> our our well, ancestors. Yeah. To tell us about, um, yes. Today. Um, well, yes, that's that is something um, I also am looking at. Um, does that work? Um, can you hear me? Should I just shout? <laughs> that might make it easier. <laughs> Use this one. Hello. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, you know, there's, of course, there's a famous Chan stories, and I forget where it is and who is involved, but the, the two monks criticizing the master who lives up the valley because he sees the cabbage leaf floating down, and they say, oh, he's very wasteful. Um, but then they see the guy coming, running after, and recovering the cabbage leaf. So there's that kind of story. But um, what I find... Um, inspirational about Tang Dynasty practices may not sound like you know something very appealing, but it is very regenerative for their communities. And those of and I don't want to anticipate Jonathan's talk, but it's um, repentance and vows, taking vows to do to do something. And that that is it's a meaningful activity, especially if supported by a community. And that is what Tang practice is all about. So repentance was, it's not, you know, oh, I'm such a horrible human being, but it's like becoming transparent to the gaze of the Buddhas so that one's own Buddha nature can resonate. Um, so this, this sort of mirroring practice was a regenerative practice for these communities. Um, repentance has gotten a bad name in you know, Western societies because of the Christian sense of, you know, sinning individuals. But in the Tang, this was a, this was a very uplifting, exhilarating community practice. And as, um, I believe it's Joanna Macy who has argued that we need to do a lot of grief processing when we move through this crisis. So, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> ah. <laughs> sorry, should I turn it's it off? Okay. okay, so I just turn it off. Yeah. Okay. That's all. And then you. Push. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So it's back and forth. Okay. Got it. Yes. Uh, recently, I came across uh, a book. It's called Narrative Economics. With what economics? Knowledge in economics. 
knowledge. By Robert Schuller, he is a professor at Yale University. Okay. He's uh, a Nobel Prize winning economics. Okay, so, okay. Uh, basically, he says that um, Um, basically, he says that the, uh, the economic uh, situation in a society is controlled by rulers. Uh, the mm. rulers can be so extensive mm. that uh, it can actually lead to downturn uh, into in the economics of yes. the society, and it can even, he says, it caused some recessions. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I brought this up because you have used extensively the scientific modeling and um, um, and also cognitive mm. science, science modeling mm. uh, used by economics people. Mm. Uh, well, Kate does, okay. yeah. And um, the scientific modeling is basically you have science phenomena out there, mm. and then we are actually model that phenomena. Hmm. And um, but whereas the society is, in fact, it itself is a model mm -hmm. which is being constructed by human beings, mm -hmm. by individuals, mm -hmm. by individual experiences. Mm -hmm. So the whatever the concepts are like entropy or energy and all these things are just the concepts we are constructing. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are maybe in transition. Mm. to better concepts mm -hmm. of how we from the uh, early civilizations like 100,000 years mm. back from mm. now a lot of civilizations mm. vanished we still do not have a mm. good handle of how to model our society mm. yeah. so it is um, it's a little bit I mean, um, surprising that we should take the scientific modeling as a basis for actually um, you know, relating that to the human values. So, so I would mm. like to know, you know why mm. you have taken the existing models made mm. by science mm. and, and the economics people mm. and then try to relate them to the human values rather than mm. starting from human experience mm. and then use a constructive uh, uh, metaphor of society. Uh, yes. Let's see if I can get this to do this now. Uh, yeah, one word, upaya. <laughs> um, because, so I'm drawing from people who are using these models because they're, they create a bridge. They're sort of that sweet spot in between. Certainly, I'm in complete agreement with you that our own experience is the embeddedness from which we start. In a longer version of this paper, I'm working with Confucian principles and Buddhist principles that support that idea. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, theorists that I'm very um, uh, supportive of working with uh, even more deeply include Bruno Latour and Isabel Stengers, who are deeply, um, they, they know the cultures of how science is, the social culture of the doing of science and they're both critical and make suggestions for how we can do it in ways that are taking into account our own experience in rege regenerative systems. So um, I just did not have space in 45 minutes to throw Isabel Stengers at everyone <laughs> as well as Kate Falworth. Um, so I, you know, basically I totally agree with you. But um, in order to speak to people who are teaching economics classes, we have to build bridges. And that is happening. That is happening in a number of places. Hong Kong University is, is making efforts in this direction. I understand. So, thank you. Yes. Hi. Um. From my understanding of permaculture, it's small-scale agriculture. Mm -hmm. But the direction of agriculture in Canada and Australia and everywhere else is to consolidate the smaller places and to make them larger, which kind of makes permaculture very difficult. Now, I have a small place with a 
few trees and things, and it's a, it's a, it's a struggle because yeah. I'm doing other things as well. Exactly. How, uh, how can we use permaculture when the basis of permaculture is small-scale agriculture, and that's completely changing right now, completely. It's not even a little bit, it's huge and massive. I know. Um, so, so those two, I can't see how you could balance uh, the uh, scientific economic model with permaculture when permaculture is disappearing faster than other species. I know. Yeah, we, we, um, I, I'm completely in sympathy. We are, you know, we're losing skills so, so quickly. It's, it's just very, very disturbing. Um, and this is one of the aims of the permaculture course that I took, is to go into detail about um, the fact that this large-scale agriculture will collapse. For example, you know, the, um, uh, which is not necessarily good news. I mean, I know it's not good news, but it's, it behooves us to keep these small experiments going and create networks of small ex uh, experiments because as he points out, um, this industrial agriculture is focused on putting um, inputs, putting fertilizer in through the water. And the soil, it's, in these systems, it's fine if the soil is completely dead, which basically it is. Um, but feeding nutrients through water makes for these very juicy looking green plants, which attract more pests which means you have to put more pesticides in, which means you have to kill the soil even further. So he analyzes in detail sort of the chemical um, cycle that is uh, making these systems unsustainable. So the more that the news can get out there that these large-scale farms are actually critically endangering our food security, the, the more we might get some, some different kinds of practices. You know, again, maybe it's too late, but there are these little tiny experiments going on all over the place in trying to rebuild embedded systems. We'll see, or we won't. <laughs> Uh 泰国、新加坡、包括台湾、还有日本都是很好的佛教的一些国家 经济的发展还是比较好的。呃，我主要通过这些问题，我想问一下老师，呃，如果佛教不可能在呃开放的情况下这样的发展，将会对经济带来什么样的一些问题？谢谢您。嗯，谢谢。So I got a little, I I got the gist of that, but I do need a translation. Oh, sorry. I got some of the gist of that, but I do need a translation to make sure I'm getting. Um, my question is basically: uh, she's I read a study that saying mm. the relationship between Buddhism and economics usually mm. could they are helping each other to grow. Mm -hmm. So in certain countries like Japan or um, Thailand, China, Taiwan, yeah. these are growing in because of Buddhism. The mm. economy is going relatively well, mm. but in, in China right now. The growth of Buddhism is already under control, mm. but China at the same time the economy is going rapidly. Mm. So how what's the effect of this kind of uh, mm. controlled Buddhism? <coughs> but at the same time the economy, of course, is going almost going well. How what's the, the effect 
that's going to be showing the long run? Hmm. Um, well, many, many people wish they knew that. Um, it's, you know, uh, mainland China is on a different part of the growth, of the growth curve. Um, so some of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist, <laughs> but um, they are going through, they, many people that I've read are saying they're, they're pretty much at peak um, uh, productive capacity at this point, and they're relying on extraction from Africa primarily to, um, to keep fueling their, their growth. So um, that is a very fragile system, even though it seems to be, again, like these, these shiny green plants, it seems to be very flourishing, but it's, it's dependent on in, inputs that can't be sustained. So um, when things start to break down, and there are signs that you know, things are starting to break down in some ways, and of course they have a huge environmental cleanup ahead of them. Um, the Buddhist organizations could step in. Um, right now, as you say, they are government controlled and they are mostly geared towards um, a kind of um, tourism for the middle class, you know, a kind of rest space for the middle class, which is a good thing. It's a place where communities can come together and people can relax and that's a good thing. Um, they could become centers for different kinds of practices. I, was, I recently did a tour of, of monasteries in Anhui in, in July, and um, very, each monastery culture is a little bit different, and uh, I did not see any that were doing any kind of, um, you know, permaculture type um, large-scale experiments, but I did see one nunnery in Jiuhuashan, which was paradise on earth. It was very small, but my god, they had everything. They had a whole recycling system going. They were, they were just uh, four nuns, four or five nuns, I think, living there. And, you know, it was completely under the radar. They're, they're growing their own tea, which they served us, and, you know, they showed us what they were growing. And, you know, you don't hear about this in the big media news networks, but I suspect that there are many of these small-scale experiments, or small-scale regenerations going on, I hope. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Adebe.